<coughs> okay, welcome to uh, second lecture in uh, this course, uh, log 502. Uh, and uh, today we will continue on the topic in chapter 2 about forecasting. Uh, first, short repetition from uh, last lecture. Uh, we started this course about uh, when um, looking at uh, one type of mathematical proof called induction. And uh, as I mentioned last week, that uh, I will not focus too much into mathematical proving uh, in this course. We will have a lot of formulas. Uh, the proofs are often given in the textbook, so you can study it. But uh, as a part of the curriculum, uh, the proofs are usually not included. But the exception is this type of proofs called induction. Um, and we uh, saw that uh, when we would like to, to prove a statement or a formula, we will have to start with a hypothesis. which is uh, the formula or the statement, statement we want to check if this is uh, true, is it correct? And uh, when we have a formula or a statement, we will first check the initial case. Is this true for the lowest possible value? And uh, if not, then we can just stop because then we have already proven that this statement or hypothesis is wrong. But if the initial case is correct, then we can assume and then we go continue to what we call the assumption step. We can assume that the hypothesis or the formula is correct for one particular value. And then if we can prove that it will still be valid, when increasing by 1. We have proven that uh, the statement or the hypothesis is valid for all positive integers, all pos positive whole number. This uh, is of course a limitation of this uh, in, in induction uh, uh, proofs on, uh, uh, on uh, integer numbers, but uh, still this idea can also be used in some other situations. Still, you need to know about this induction, you need to know about proving formulas, that this is quite important. So, the fourth, fourth and final step here is what we call the induction step. So these are the four steps in the induction uh, method. And uh, you will also be given some uh, uh, a few uh, problems on this induction proving on uh, on your first assignment, will I, which I will present in, in a short while. Uh, we also started on the topic about forecasting in chapter 2. And if we go fast through the first and uh, introduction slides here, we looked at different types of uh, development of the demand. And here we can see that we have a purely random, we don't have, uh, well, we can't, we can't uh, assume that there is a, a trend or, uh, or seasons or anything. This is seem to be totally random. The, the demand for one period, one month, might be different from another mo month, but it's, it doesn't seem to be any system here. Uh, one other type is when you can clearly see a linear trend. Still, uh, you have some kind of random random uh, uh, randomization of, of the demand here but you should be able to find and develop a formula for the trend which we can see here that uh, the demand is increasing from one period to another period uh, it's usually not possible to get exactly the correct values because there are so many uncertain elements here but still when you have an increasing or eventually a dec uh, decreasing trend you should be able to find uh, find a line that will uh, uh, will show show the trend and which should also be possible to use in uh, in the forecasting for the coming periods. 
Uh, third example here, which we will not go into uh, very much into details of models for this case, but you might also have some kind of quadratic or exponential trend <coughs> that you suddenly have some kind of explosion in the demand for your particular product. Then from a low level, you will suddenly have very high decrease, and uh, this might happen for, uh, uh, for a certain period, but for all trends, sometimes it has to, to stop. So this, uh, all these um, forecasting methods uh, will can, can be useful for, for a shorter period, but uh, uh, when you go too far into the future, there are so many uncertainties and uh, uh, there are so many things that can happen that the, the forecast will usually be more and more inaccurate the further into the future you go. Uh, the fourth example here is something that we will uh, look at uh, methods for when you have seasonal differences like we see here. You might have, uh, well, s sell much more ski equipment in the winter, for example, not so much in, in the summer season. And you have different demand in different seasons. And you can also have a trend line here. So here you have both a trend, like we had in this example, and also seasonal differences. And we will come back to models for that later in this course, um, probably uh, next Tuesday. So we also looked at uh, different ways of evaluating the forecast. And we had two different methods. One, the MAD, which is the, the mean absolute deviation. You look at the difference between the forecast and the demand and divide by uh, the number of data points. The, uh, this is the, the average deviation, the difference between the forecast and the demand. And you have also another one, which is called the, uh, uh, called the, the square or uh, mean uh, square error which is same, that take the sum and divide by the number of data point, but then you should, instead of using the absolute uh, uh, deviation, you should take the square of, of the, the absolute uh, deviation. And then, of course, very large uh, differences between the forecast and, uh, and the demand will have a higher value since you take the square when compared to only the, the absolute uh, uh, absolute uh, value of the deviation. Uh, and we started looking at what we call the moving averages method, oh. which is one way to, uh, uh, to find a forecast in a, uh, in a stationary series when you don't have trends or season present. Uh, just choose a number, in this case the capital N, which is the number of last data points you should include in your, um, in your forecasting method. And then the forecast will be the average of the N last measured values. The demand in the previous, previous the second previous, and the number of, of previous uh, uh, periods that you have chosen to include. So the forecast for the next and the coming periods will then be the average of the n last measured uh, uh, re mo most recent observations. Okay, so this was how far we got last time. Um, and I will today continue first on another method for uh, stationary series, then we should look at the uh, trend-based methods, uh, and then the next step will be to include also seasonal differences. Uh, before I continue, I will just show <coughs> the first assignment, which was uploaded in Fronter yesterday. So you should now be able to solve the first assignment. This is a pass or fail assignment, so we will not be given any grades on, on that one. Um, you have two weeks. Present, uh, the publish date was actually yesterday, but presentation days, date is today, and submission is ne uh, the Tuesday in two weeks. Actually, I should have it on 
Wednesday morning. So if you choose to work during the night, that would be okay. So I think the, the deadline on uh, in Fronter for uh, um, delivering in, in Fronter will be at 8 o'clock on, on Wednesday morning. Um, preferably, you should work in groups of two to four students. If you absolutely want to work alone, you can do that. Just send me an email to and apply and you will get permission for, for that. And uh, groups established by yourself, assignment is mandatory and needs to be approved to complete the course. And of course, remember to write the name of all the members of the group on the, the front page. Uh, and you can deliver either directly with a paper copy. Uh, you can send it electronically as an attachment to an email or you can upload in Fronter. But if you upload in Fronter, you should, uh, you should zip or uh, combine all the files in into a zip file so I don't have to deal with lots of, of, of different uh, files for your, um <coughs> for your assignment. You should deliver only one file even if the answer consists of more than one file. So then, if so, combine in a zip file. And you can then either send it to my email address or upload in Fronter or eventually write a paper copy and deliver it to me. So, first problem, number one, is about this induction method. Prove by induction that this formula is correct. The sum of the numbers 2, 4, 6, 8 and so on, mul 2 multiplied by n, where n is the index number, that means that when index number 1 is the lowest value uh, in, in the series, which is 2. 2 multiplied by 1. <coughs> when n is equal to 2, it means 2 multiplied by 2, which is 4. When n is equal to 3, it's 2 multiplied by 3, which is 6, and so on. Continue up to a number or a variable of 2 multiplied by n. This formula should be equal to n multiplied by n plus 1. This is the formula you should uh, prove and show by induction that this is correct. And you have, uh, you have seen the, the um, lecture note about induction which is uploaded in Fronter, uh, that this example is not very different from the example used in, uh, in that paper which is I also presented uh, last Tuesday. And the second one, a bit more complex, but here 1 plus 4 plus 7 plus 10 and so on, continue. The formula here is 3n minus 2. And this series, the sum of this series, should be equal to n multiplied by 3n minus 1 divided by 2. So these are the two induction <coughs> problems you should solve in this assignment. Problem number two is about regression analysis, which I will present later uh, today. Uh, first, as mentioned, I will present one more method for uh, forecasting in stationary series. And then regression analysis is a method for forecasting when you have a trend. And then you should use that one. Here you have data, 12 data, which is the sales in 2002 for the PlayStation to game console and you have the data given here I have also uploaded an Excel sheet with the actual values of the data and then you should use regression analysis to try to find a trend line which best describes these values in the 12 months of 2002 and then continue this line to make predictions for 2003, 4 and 5. So here are the three sub-problems, the three questions within this problem. Uh, the figures show the sales figures, numbers of the full sales for PlayStation 2 in 2002. And uh, the Excel sheet will also include the numbers for the coming years 2003, 4 and 5. Question A, use a simple linear regression model, calculate the parameters A and B. We'll come back to the details uh, later today. And then use the model to predict the future sales values up to and including 2005. 
and only the data shown in the figure from 2002 should be used for estimation. The console sales PS2 is the <coughs> Excel sheet with the numbers. Here is the same, uh, the same uh, graph or uh, the, the, the chart, which I also used in, in the problem description. Here we have the data for 2002 and continue with 2003, 4, and 5. So use the data, 12 first data point, to make prediction for the coming years. Then in B, compare your prediction with the actual sales data for the period 2003 to 5. And then answer the last question, what is the reason for the large deviation, which you hopefully will get, between the predicted and the actual sales? And do you have any suggestions for improving your model? So this is uh, well, quite small. The, the, the next two assignments will be much more uh, time consuming and much more work uh, and estimations and the calculations uh, to do. Uh, but this is a well, small assignment which you, can, uh, which you should solve to, uh, to, well, to first show that you understand the induction principles and then also uh, you should show that you are able to to use a simple regression model to predict uh, da data or predict the forecast into, uh, into the future. Okay, that's about assignment number two. And uh, if you want, you can answer that one in Norwegian or English. That's up to yourself. So Norwegian students, you don't have to, to answer in, uh, in English on, on the assignments. And also on the exam, it's... Uh, uh, well, you can ch uh, choose by yourself which, uh, which language, or at least between Norwegian and English. So, let's now continue on the topic about forecasting. We looked at the moving averages, which is the way to find the average of the last, the n last data points. We showed a small example uh, last uh, Tuesday that we had, uh, uh, we had an example from page 65 in, your, uh, in the textbook and we had observations of 200. This will be the, the actual demand which is historical data. We had observation for 200, 250, and 175. And then we should try to make a forecast by using the moving averages method for, let's see, this is period number one, two, and three, and then we should use this data to make a forecast for period number four, and then forecast for period number four will be equal to the average of the three data points here. So n, in this case, the number of data points used for the forecast should be equal to three. This is a decision. And this is not obvious that we should use this number. This will be found by trial and, and failure and uh, uh, experience for, uh, from uh, uh, over a longer time period when you know uh, what number will be the best for your particular demand. In so some markets, you should have a very high number, average. Uh, uh, the average will be, um, you should use the average of, uh, over a long time period, lots of data points. Uh, in some other markets, you should probably have a very small one where the demand is more, more dynamic and, and varying, not, not so, so stable over time. So here, the forecast for period number four will be the average of 200 plus 250 plus 175 divided by three, which should be approximately 208 if we round to the closest integer. So here the forecast is 208. Looking at the data we will get eventually, we make a forecast and then we will 
after a while, get some historical data for that particular period. And in this case, we find that the demand was actually only 186 in period number four. Then we can make the forecast error. At least we can find the absolute value, which is the uh, difference between the de actual demand and the forecasted value. So here, the absolute uh, value of the deviation will be 22. Difference between 208 and 186. And then we can, when we have several other uh, values, we can find the different measures uh, of uh, MAD and uh, the mean, mean average uh, deviation and also the, the mean uh, square, uh, the mean absolute deviation or the mean uh, square error. The different va values uh, or the different measures of uh, forecasting methods here. Looking at the difference between the actual demand and the forecast. So, in this case, we see that we have some deviation, 22 items. And now, when we have data for also for period number four, we can make a new forecast for period number five. Which now will be the average of the three last values here, 250, 175, and 186. So we actually have to exchange the oldest value, this one, by the new value, this one. Find the average, divide by the number of data points, and this will now be approximately 204. And so we can actually continue. New forecast, 204. We will eventually get a new data value here, new observation, which in this case, this example, will be 225. And the, now the absolute uh, value of the deviation will be 21, the difference between 225 and 204. Uh, and so on, we can continue and continue and continue when we we can make a new forecast and we can also, when we get new data, we can update the forecast. But what is important with this method for stationary series is that uh, here you have a forecast which is actually constant. So if you in period number five should make a forecast for period number 10, five months ahead, then the value will still be 204. Because you don't have any information about any development, any trend, or any seasonal differences, or, and so on. You, at every point of time, you will make a forecast, which is the uh, approximation of any demand into, in any period into the future. So let's have a look at uh, the Excel sheet where this is coded which is X chapter 27, uploaded in Frontier last week. And here we should have a look at the moving averages uh, sheet here. This is the moving average for a period of three, which I have started showing on, on the blackboard here. We have the data points, the actual demand. We have the, mm, uh, the moving average which is updated and use the three last data point. Like here, we have references to cell B through three and four, two, three and four, take the average, and then we will just continue that formula. Use the last three data <coughs> points and take the average here, and then compare with the actual demand and find the absolute deviation and the square of the deviation and calculate the measures of MAD, which is the average of these points. And also the MSE will be the average of the squared deviation here. What we, uh, well, the decision when using such a method will then be what is the number of N? how many periods should we include in our calculations. And here we can see I've also, well, we used three in the first example here. I also uh, made 
the moving average by using six periods. And then, of course, you can't make any forecast until period, period seven. This will be the average of the six first data points. And you can also still be have find the, uh, the absolute deviation and the square of the absolute deviation to have some measure of the accuracy of, of, this, uh, of, of this formula. Um, so we can also see this uh, graph here, which shows the actual the, uh, the MA of three, moving average of three, compared to the actual demand. And here we can see that we have some kind of delay, even if we have some kind of increasing trend here, at, at least in the start of this full period. We can see that the forecasting method will actually not fine or uh, adjust up to that trend until a few periods later. And if we go to this figure, we will also see that if you have some trends in the data, this is a graph of the actual demand, then with a moving average of three, you will have a delay. The trend will not be uh, discovered for before after a few uh, periods. And also, when using a larger n value for the moving average method, it will take longer time until you actually are able to identify a trend in, in, the, in the demand. So, by using this moving average, me average method, then each new observation will need to recalculate recalcul a new forecast that will be the expected demand for all the future period. Like we saw here, when you get a new observation, just compare to the previous uh, forecast and make a new forecast for the n last observations. So, then I will present another method, or first maybe we can try to have a look at this slide here, has some kind of summary of the moving average. Uh, some advantages, well, quite easy to understand, take the average of a certain number of data points, not so very difficult. It's also quite easy to compute when you have a Excel sheet, for example, just put in the formula and copy the formula to, uh, to, um, to the new cells when you get some new data. And it will also provide a stable forecast. This forecast will be the forecast for all coming periods because you don't have, uh, well, until you get some new information that will update the forecast. Uh, some disadvantages here also requires to save all the past n data points. You need to have observation or, or you need to have the actual values here of the demand, uh, which is not necessary with the next method I will, uh, will present. Um, you also have seen that we will lay behind the trend. You are not able to identify a trend until a certain number of, of periods. And also, this method will ignore complex relationships in, in data. Trends is one, uh, well, complex, or at least one relationship. Seasonal difference is another, and there might also be even more complex relationships, which this simple moving averages method is not able to, to identify. So, let's now continue to the next <coughs> method, which is called exponential smoothing. This is also a method to be used when you have uh, uh, when you have stationary data, you don't have trends, you don't have seasons. Uh, you want to identify when you have some kind of random data points here, you want to identify a forecast which is stable. If this is today, then you should make a forecast, this point, and this will now be 
uh, the forecast or the expected demand for all the coming uh, periods until you get some new information and should be able to update this uh, model. Here, instead of using the last data points, you are only using the last forecast and the last forecast error, or eventually the last forecast and the most recent observation. That means, in this case, we have in period um, 4, we have a forecast of 208. We should know this number. And then we get a new data of 186. And this is actually the only information we need. Then just skip, uh, or you don't have to well, know or uh, keep the data, which actually uh, was, was used to get this forecast. But as long as you have the value of the forecast and the value of the last demand, you should be able to make a forecast for the coming periods. Here we have this, what we call the smoothing constant. This is an exponential smoothing method. This alpha, Greek letter alpha, is called the smoothing constant. And it is used to give the weight of the most recent observation compared to the last forecast. This alpha will always be between 0 and 1. And as we can see here, the new forecast will be the alpha value multiplied by the new or the most recent observation plus 1 minus alpha multiplied by the last forecast. If alpha is equal to 0 0.1, that means that the weight of the most recent observations uh, will, will be 10%. And 1 minus 0 0.1, means 0 0.9, will be the weight of the last forecast. Uh, and then, of course, when uh, alpha is equal to 1, then the new forecast will be equal to the most recent observation. If alpha is 0, then the new forecast will be equal to the last forecast. And all differences, all, all, all variations of alpha between 0 and 1 will then be some kind of weighting between the recent observation and the last forecast. So if you want to have more weight on the observation compared to the forecast, then you should have a large alpha. And if the forecast over time is considered to be more accurate than the actual the most recent observation, then you should have a small alpha. Uh, this is another way to, um, to show the same formula. Use the last forecast and minus this alpha value multiplied by the last forecast error. This is just writing this formula in another way. So. So here we can also write this in uh, with the notation that the forecast for period T should be equal to the alpha smoothing constant multiplied by the demand in the previous period, the most recent observation, demand in period T minus 1. And plus <coughs> 1 minus <coughs> alpha multiplied by the forecast for the last period. Forecast of period t minus 1. So this is a way to write this with notations, write this formula here. Or eventually, like the second uh, alternative here, the forecast for period t will be equal to the forecast in the previous period plus, no, minus, um, 
alpha. This, of, of course, depends on uh, the sequence of, uh, of the forecast and the demand in this parenthesis here. But then if we use minus, then we will have the forecast of t minus 1 minus the demand in period t minus 1. This is two ways to write the same formula. Sometimes it's easier to just look at the forecast error and look at the previous forecast instead of multiplying by uh, both the demand and the forecast by, by this smoothing constant. So this is the exponential smoothing method. And the important thing here, the important decision when using such a method is the value of alpha. We remember that when using the moving average method, we had the decision of n, how many uh, periods, how many data points we should include in the method. And also in this exponential smoothing method, we have one important decision, and this is the value of the alpha, which is a value between 0 and 1, and usually is, well, between 0 0.1, 0 0.2 is uh, some kind of common value here. But there is no exact number which is the correct value for this. It might be different in different markets. And this decision needs to be uh, made when uh, looking and trial and, and error and, uh, uh, and looking at uh, the demand in the previous uh, uh, well histo historical data. What value we will actually fit best into your particular market? Sometimes you should have a large value of the alpha when you have uh, a quite uh, dynamic demand that the, the recent observation will be more important than the forecast, which is actually some kind of uh, uh, well found by uh, uh, calculating and using uh, old data points. Uh, and sometimes the forecast should be more stable. You have lots of variation from one uh, period to, to the other, so the forecast over time will be more accurate or should be given more weight than the most recent observations. This is different in different markets, so there is no actual uh, correct value, say that this value is better than the other value. You need to calculate and find, find that by, uh, by yourself. Uh, of course, in problems in, in this course, you will be given these values because uh, we, we cannot expect that you should, should analyze a market in, in, uh, in, small, uh, in a small text describing a problem. So you will be given that the alpha, the smoothing constant in this case, is, for example, 0 0.15. But in real world, this is an important decision which needs to be, uh, to be considered and, uh, and you need to find what is actually best suited for your particular case. Yeah. Okay, we can just. Yeah, like here also, it says that it's uh, generally small and around 0 0.1, 0 0.2 is some kind of uh, common value o of this um, smoothing constant. And these slides also show in symbols, the same method here, that the forecast for t now period t plus 1, here I had used period t, uh, but the, the uh, well important thing here is the forecast for the next period, the index should be one higher than the demand and the forecast here. And this way, since the forecast for period t plus 1 can be described this way, we can also describe the forecast for period t by using the formula here, and then we can describe that this way, and then we get the forecast for period t minus 1, which uh, will now be uh, well <laughs> continued here in, uh, into, uh, into the start of, of this, uh, when you actually started this uh, exponential smoothing method. But since we are using here 1 minus alpha, uh, the next value, 1 minus alpha to the power of 2, 
And then, of course, 1 minus alpha to yeah, uh, 1 minus alpha uh, to the power of 2 multiplied by alpha and so on. So, so the weight for the older demand will be smaller and smaller. Uh, but of course, all the forecast values are found by analyzing the previous historical data shown in the um, demand uh, or the, the list of, of the demand for previous periods. So here, the method will apply a set of exponentially declining weights to the past data, and it's easy to show that the sum of the weights will be exactly 1. And one last slide before we, before we take the break. Here, we can also analyze the weight. That uh, yeah, weight applied in data when i periods old. So that means that the previous will be have a weight of uh, 0 0.0. Uh, well, uh, on, on index number 0, you have 0 0.1 if this is the value of the smoothing constant. So the weight of the most recent observation will be 0 0.1, and the second most recent observation will be 0 0.09, and so on. We will then continue and get a lower and lower value here. OK, then I think we take a break, continue in uh, 15 minutes on uh, and looking at examples on this exponential smoothing method.